Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 40 of Talking Nets. And we have a very, very, very special episode for you all today. Not only because it's episode number 40, big Sean Kemp's number. Shout out Kevin Durant wearing the Sean Kemp jersey in his return to Seattle. Not only because half of the pre-COVID Nets are not going to be going to Orlando, but because we have the one, the only, Chris Sheeran from the Yes Network joining us today, along with my co-host, Keith McPherson. Keith, how are you doing today? What's up, Hudson? What's up, Chris? I am good. I am great. We are uh, now on the second week of July. Teams have reported. We saw some baseball on Yes Network the last two nights, a little inner squad scrimmage I enjoyed. It's, it's feeling right, you know, it feels like we're getting back to some normalcy. We're getting back to what we all love. Um, basketball is on the way, and we're going to talk about it today. That's, that's the key, what you just said right there, uh, Keith, is that normalcy. You know, we're starting to get sports back, and I think uh, everybody needs uh, some distraction from this uh, pandemic that's going on. And uh, just to get back to something normal, seeing Miguel Andujar take Garrett Cole deep on the first pitch he sees, that was pretty cool. I know this is a Nets podcast, but you got that Savages shirt on. And yeah, uh, M- Miggy showed last night that he had a little bit of savagery in him against Cole. Yeah, I got that Yankee hat right here. We're a Nets podcast, but we're with John Boy Media. We're always rocking with the Yankees. We're Yankees but, fans. I yeah, mean, we're, we're, we're Yankees fans. Hudson is a Yankee fan. I'm obviously a Yankee fan. You're a Yankee fan. Somebody listening to this pod, multiple somebody's listening to this pod are also <laughs> Yankees and born, Nets Born fans. and raised. Born and raised. Absolutely. Same. Well, you're saying born and raised. Let's give the audience who doesn't know you as well as they should a little bit of background on yourself, Chris Sheeran. Sure, sure. Um, wow. My journey started, boys, when uh, – the dynasty started in television back in 1996. That's I uh, graduated college, Rowan University down in Glassboro, New Jersey. That was in uh, December of 95. And uh, I always joke about this. I had to go out to Las Vegas to get a job in South Hackensack, New Jersey. When I was out in Las Vegas running a conference, I was one of 15 students picked from Rowan to go out there. It, it's just uh, a big production uh, it's the National Association of Television Programmers and Engineers. They have all these booths. They have this huge floor. And when we get a break, we were basically interns with these red blazers. They were awful. But when we got a break, we got to go around to these different tables and meet different people in the business. And I was lucky enough to meet the people for Major League Baseball Productions. And that's where I broke in. Uh, I was a logger, basically. I was making $9.54 an hour, but I was doing it watching baseball. <laughs> so it doesn't get too much better than that. Uh, that wasn't paying the bills. I had to pay the college loans back uh, in full, and that took just a shade under 13 years. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't really cutting it, making $9.54 an hour, and I was icing donuts and uh, also slicing bread at an A&P bakery in the morning. And I can't begin to tell you the reality that sets in when you go to uh, college for four and a half years, because I started at a community college, uh, Middlesex County, uh, Middlesex County College, actually. But when you start there and you go for four and a half years and, and you pour your heart into it, and you make the dean's list almost every semester, and then you're sitting there slicing rye bread <laughs> when you want to be working in television, uh, it's a little disconcerting, but you know, you work hard, you make contacts and you keep moving. And I, then I started working for MSNBC in 1996. So I, I was there for six years on and off. Uh, and then uh, as luck would have it right after September 11th, um, I was doing the overnights at MSNBC and I was there actually the day that happened as a tape producer. Uh, it was one of the worst days of my life. Uh, found out later that night that one of my friends was in the North Tower and he died. So uh, that was terrible. And then for six months after that, my job was basically watching them pull bodies out of the wreckage and uh, logging it for the morning producers in the morning news. Uh, And then one of my friends who I used to work with at MSNBC started at Yes. And after Yes denied my uh, first go round with my resume, uh, this guy vouched for me and because he knew how hard I worked and he brought me over and the rest is history, boys. I've been there since 2002. Wow. Well, that is quite the story. And for me, myself, being a college student, uh, being acutely aware 
of the student loans that I am compiling <laughs> and hoping that I can pay it's, off. It's no picnic. <laughs> no, no, it is not. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do my best to follow in your example, get, make that Dean's list for, for four years. But now I think we should flash forward to today and what you yourself and your role is with the Yes Network. And I also want you to talk a little bit about your podcast because I know, you know, you're a big podcast fan. I saw you talked about it with Ruko, a lot of big podcasters at the Yes Network. So if you could just talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, uh, my, my role there has evolved, guys. It, it's gone from uh, basically I was just an associate producer on the Mike and the Mad Dog show when we were doing that show before we did. Mike by himself, and obviously now the Michael K show. Uh, from 2002 to 2004, I was just in that capacity. Uh, I would count us back from break, and I just felt like I needed to do something more. You know, once you get your foot in the door, you, you can't be complacent. You can't just want to sit in the one spot that you're in. You want to continue to evolve. And before I got to yes, it was nine years of sending out VHS tapes all over the country and getting rejection letters. And luckily, all through high school, I was rejected left and right by the women I tried to ask out. So I was, I was really, <laughs> I was desensitized to all the rejection. So um, just making a little joke there. Uh, but, you know, after those nine years, I figured my on-air aspirations were by the wayside. And then Mike and Chris, the, the, the show that preceded them, I'm pretty sure it was Jody and Sid, if I'm not mistaken. I can't recall exactly who it was, but they would always go overtime. And we would end up sitting on a still of Mike and Chris's face that just said coming up. So I basically petitioned my boss. I said, look, I don't have to be on camera, but why don't I do just an update of our own to get us on clean when they come on at, at 105? So my boss, uh, one of my bosses, Woody Fryman, said, "Put it on tape and send it to me, and let me see uh, if if we could if we could have you do this." So I did it. He approved it, and I start. And he wanted me on camera, so I started doing it on camera. And I I I still have some of the early sports sprints that I did. At some point, I'm going to burn them <laughs> because <laughs> I never want to see those again. But uh, yeah, it's been an evolution, man. Yes has been, yes treats you like family. They really do. Uh, throughout this pandemic, they've been fantastic. They, they've kept us up to speed with all the safety protocols and everything else. Uh, I've gone from just being an associate producer to uh, doing the batting practice show. I, I did high school hockey. I did Yale on Yes football. I did Ivy League football and basketball, both in a play-by-play -play capacity and a sideline capacity. Uh, I'm doing play-by-play -play for the Liberty now, which is one of the most unbelievable opportunities that I've had in my career to this point. Uh, and last year, that first year was was such a great time and such a great ride because you work with tremendous people at Yes, and it makes the games even better. Even though the Liberty didn't have a successful season last year, it was successful in the fact that we all came together working together on those games and we put out a really good product and it made us all feel really good. But I, I, I host, I've become the main host for the Nets pre and post game shows as well. Uh, I fill in for, for Bob Lorenz on the Yankees pre and post game shows, which I love. Baseball is of course my first love, uh, but I love all sports. Of course. Um, then I grew up a Knicks fan uh, and everybody knows that. And whoever listens to my podcast knows that I grew up a Knicks fan. But it's, it's pretty much impossible to root against the Nets. Uh, the guys that they've put together and the culture that they've brought into Brooklyn, uh, it just makes you want to root for that team. But the evolution of my career and the ebbs and flows, look, it, it hasn't been all roses. You know, it, it's like that speech Rocky gives his son in Rocky Balboa. Uh, life's going to knock you down no matter if you have the job or not. You always have to keep fighting. You always have to keep swinging. And that's what I've done my entire career. And look, I'm, guys, I'm still not complacent. I still look at this as me being in that chair, just being an associate producer. Now that I'm on the air, I, I, I want at some point to do play-by-play -play for the Yankees. I want to do play-by-play -play for the Nets. And that's what I hope this opportunity with the Liberty gives me. But I don't want to look too far into the future. I want to concentrate on what I have now and getting sports back in general and doing the best job that I can to uh, bring all of the things that I do 
uh, at the highest level. A quote that I live by is John Wooden, and that is failure to prepare is preparing to fail. So if you want to take that and run with it, you can, but I've lived by it. And uh, in this business, guys, let's face it, you know, the New York audience, they could tell if you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so many gems that you just dropped, so many things that you just said parallel with my own experience and my journey. Uh, that quote, you know, I'm always preparing. I'm always preparing because I have failed in the past when I wasn't prepared. And I hate that feeling of being on a show or being on the spot and you're not ready. Um, when you talk about the Yes Network and the Yes Network family, when I first met Chris, I ran into Chris my first time coming to the <laughs> Yes Network office. And uh, I'm connected with Josh Isaac, who produces you know, shows for the Nets. I'm connected with Jonathan Ziegler and Kevin Sullivan, who do stuff around the Nets, the Yankees for Yes Network. And I look at those guys as mentors. And the first time I came to the Yes Network, I'm telling you, I, I, I put a suit on. I wanted to present myself the right way. And I was just blown away because I'm a Yankee fan and a Nets fan. I'm like, this is where you want to be as a fan and someone in media doing what I'm doing. And I, I ran into Chris. He was coming out of the gym, you know, getting his, <laughs> getting his little swole workout on. And that's something that I do. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I know you. And, uh, you know, I was just happy to see him as a, a face I recognized from Nets coverage. You know, Chris, for you guys listening, when they cut back to the studio, Chris is there. Halftime, Chris is there. Post game. Chris is there. And he was one of the one con consistents in the post-game um, pregame show for the Nets. You know, like uh, we saw like Frank Isola, um, Nancy, uh, a couple different people pop in. But Chris was pretty consistent with the Nets this year and, and maybe a couple years before. What else did you say? Oh, you talked about um, slicing rye bread at an AMP <laughs> and just the journey and how you're going to take some yeah, L's. You're going to take some losses oh, this yeah. week. I just came up on two years since I quit my job at Rock Nation, and I thought that was going to be my last corporate job, and it really was my last corporate job until I started working at John Boy Media, but uh, in between that time and those two years, I drove for Lyft, I delivered for Uber Eats, I worked at a restaurant for two months just because I knew that I needed to like, have gigs where I could still create content, do podcasts, go to events, go to games and cover games but I couldn't be at a desk. I couldn't be at a place 40, 50 hours a week in one spot. And, you know, some people, even in my family and friends were kind of questioning me, like, what are you doing working at a restaurant? What are you doing <laughs> driving Lyft? I'm like, listen, I know what I'm doing. I know it's where I'm going. It's all part of the plan, right? Yeah, yeah, like I have to sacrifice and do this. I have to be humble and do this right now. It's temporary. And I mean, with those student loans, I've got more in student loans than I've got in the bank. I'll be paying those student <laughs> loans for the next few hey, years. But it's, it's worth it. It's same. part of it. Yeah. Um, Hudson is going to go to school. At, well, he goes to school at Fordham, and he's going to start radio and television as his major or focus, which, I, I mean, I don't know if it's confirmed, but I'd like to see him do that because he's my co-host, and I think highly of him. I went to school for radio and television at Monmouth University, and when I came out of school, I had nothing. I had no leads. I had no recommendations. I had no one answering any type of emails or any type of resumes that I sent in. And I ended up, you know, just trying to figure it out. Um, you broke in, you said with MLB. I also broke in with MLB. I got into the MLB fan cave a couple years after I graduated. And that's what kind of propelled me um, to where I am now that like, that was the first thing on my resume that was credible. It's funny. You said that, you know, MLB productions was that for you. Right. So I knew I liked this guy. I'm glad we got him on talking next. <laughs> hey, uh, let me let, let me let me let me stop you there, Keith, because I, I have to say this: it, it, it's about it's about all those times that on the journey that you do fail, because yeah. this this goes back to my childhood and my father. God rest his soul. We lost him in November. It's it's been an awful it's been an awful run for my family. I lost my father in November. I lost my cousin in January. It's just 2020 and, and, and right before 2020 started has absolutely been atrocious. But what my father provided for me my entire life was the notion that if you work hard, eventually it will pay off and the squeaky wheel gets the oil. You're not going to get anything. You know, my father-in-law also has a saying, and I won't curse because I don't want to curse, but my father-in-law says, wish in one hand and you know what in the other and see which fills up faster. Wishing isn't going to get you anything. Right. Wishing will get you nothing. 
You have to work hard. And Keith, I'm just sorry that you didn't know me when you graduated Monmouth, because one of the things I like to do, and I brought up my father because he had nothing to do with this business. Everything that I've done in television, I've done on my own, yeah. on my own. I've made my own way. I've carved out my own path. My father was a computer programmer for, for the government. He worked for the Department of Commerce his entire life, basically until he dropped dead, he worked. So he, he instilled in me that work ethic. When, when, when he was first married to my mother, he worked three jobs. He did whatever he needed to do to provide for my mother and my older brother who was just born. So that work ethic has been instilled in me my entire life. So the fact that um, you didn't know me at the time and I didn't know anybody when I was breaking in, that kind of gets me upset because I wish you did know to reach out because I try to help whoever reaches out to me because I didn't have that person. And look, I might not be able to get you a job, but if you want to sit there for a half hour and pick my brain, whether it be on, well, now we're doing Zooms, but if you want to go back and forth on email, if you want to Zoom me, you want to do anything, all you have to do is reach out. I don't care if you're in high school. I don't care if you're in college. I don't care if you're in grade school for crying out loud. Yeah. If this is a career path you want to you wanna try, then I want to help. I want to try to be that footstool to get you to the next rung on the ladder. That's absolutely the, an amazing mentality to have. And I think it's something that we've heard from a lot of people that we've had on. We had Ian Eagle on. And he, he talked about... Ian, Ian is... Well, let me just stop you there, Hudson. Just one second. I'm sorry. Ian Eagle is probably <laughs> the nicest person in broadcasting. I, I think about how good he is and think about the time he gives to everybody. Not everybody's like that. And Ian has been like that since day one when I met him. I cannot say enough good about that man and his family. Well, that's the train that I was on, and I'm glad you, you took it to the place I wanted you to go, Chris. What you're talking about is you're always on the come up. You're always working up. You're always working for something. And even though some might see, oh, you have a play-by-play -play gig, that's you know, the pinnacle, but you're working to get to a higher pinnacle. And it seems like the Yes Network, especially with Ian Eagle, is a great place to make those connections, to make those friends, to work towards that pinnacle to that higher level. So, do, I mean, I guess you've already answered this, but, you know, the help you've gotten from Ian Eagle and whoever it may be at the Yes Network, like how much has that contributed to your ability to, you know, expand your horizons when it comes to all this? When I first got the opportunity to do play-by-play -play for Yale basketball, and football. At first, the package was Yale on Yes. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was Yale on Yes first. And then we did an all-encompassing Ivy League package with all the teams. But when I got my first opportunity to do play-by-play, -play, um, who did I reach out to? The play-by-play the -play whisperer, <laughs> Ian Eagle. <laughs> um, and he couldn't have been more gracious with his time and I wish I could, I don't want to run away from the computer, but I, I still have it upstairs in my house. He gave me his sheet that he prepares with all the players, the coach, there's a box for the coach. There's two boxes for the coach. And there's, I, I believe he has 15 boxes for the players on this sheet. And I looked at some, he sent me some of his, so I could have a, a reference on how to build that sheet. So what I've done is if people have reached out to me, I forwarded them Ian's stuff, and, and then I've showed them, because uh, I kind of took Ian's format and made it my own. I, I, I made it so it's, it's my own thing, and that's what everybody does. You know, no one's going to use somebody else's uh, program the way they, they do things. You, you, you just make it so it's yours, and that's what I've done with mine. And I, I have, it's amazing, I have this book, it flips open. And when you flip it open, it's all highlighted <laughs> and it's color coordinated. I, I am so OCD when it comes to preparing. Keith, this goes to what you were saying about how you're always prepared for things. Well, this is me, man. Like, I, like it's blue. Like, if it's the Chicago sky, all right, their primary color is blue and they're blue and yellow. So their players get uh, highlighted in light blue. And if there's an interesting tidbit about one of the players, it gets a, a yellow highlighter. And I know, like, when I'm calling the game, if I look down, boom, my eye goes right to the part because I know exactly where that player is on that board. I don't have to search. 
because I've been studying the damn thing for yeah. two to three days. So I know exactly where it is, but it's not only I and Eagle. I have to give props to, to almost everybody who works uh, as talent for the S network. Um, Bob Lorenz, first and foremost, whenever I have uh, any kind of uh, doubt or issue or anything, I go in his office, I shut the door, I go on his couch, and it's like Sigmund Freud of sports broadcasting is, is putting me on the couch and getting me through whatever the hell I'm getting through. Uh, he's been tremendous throughout my time there. Uh, Fred Hickman, before him. I wasn't on the air when Fred was there, uh, but he was our first um, Yankees and Nets pre and post host. Uh, he came from CNNSI with Bob. Uh, he's the one who brought Bob over from CNNSI, and Bob came up. But Fred, too. Fred was extremely gracious with his time and one of the nicest people I've met in the broadcast field. Um, Jack Curry, uh, who went to Fordham, <laughs> he's, he's had uh, nothing but great advice for me over time. You know, And you're both Yankee fans, so this will probably hit home with both of you. But, Keith, I want to get your, your thoughts on this really quick. And that's the fact, you know, my dad – when he watched baseball, he would get into it and get really, really energetic, energetic, you know, because he played, he played semi-pro baseball. He tried out for the Yankees. So when he was watching, he was a catcher. So he's one of those who he's always thinking, he's always, you know, he, he would watch a game. It would be watching a game with like a, a physicist. Mm -hmm. So it was great. But at the same time, he was so animate and so emotional about the game. But Jack taught me, you know, dial back the emotion a little bit and look analytically at the game. And I'm not talking about sabermetrics. I'm talking about, yeah, have that vested interest as a emotional fan. But at the same time, instead of getting that pissed off reaction about something, sit back and try to figure out why that pitch was thrown or why the cutoff wasn't hit. You know, you're always – there's so many machinations in the game of baseball. And, again, I know this is a Nets – uh, I know this is talking Mets. So no, this is. <laughs> I'm just trying to make. This is point. this is talking Chris Sheeran today. We're we're all we're going in on all you. I I don't I don't want to make it about me though. I'm I, that's not me. Um, but Jack has been great. Uh, Nancy Newman, uh, Ryan Rucco. Uh, I, I don't want to miss it. Kenny Singleton. I mean, talk John about Flaherty. John Flaherty. Uh, thank you, Keith, because I'm gonna forget people. Al Leiter when he was with us. Paul O'Neill. Ken Singleton. Kenny and David Cohn, just everybody. Everybody welcomes you in. And you're talking about Paul O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, Kenny, I'll watch a little bit of the Yankees. Yeah. yeah. I mean, O'Neill, how many um how many championships has O'Neill won? How many championships has Cohn won? How how much how much success have they had in the game of baseball? To, to me, when I first met them, they're like walking gods. And then they treat me – it took a while to just – oh, what's up? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because when, when you're a fan, it's, it, it's, it takes a little bit to disassociate from the fan. Hey, they're just – you know, touch them, pinch them. They're, they're <laughs> human beings, yeah. but they're just human beings who had <laughs> superlative baseball and, and, and athletic skills. So, you know, it's just – it, it, and I said, pinch them. I, I always have to pinch myself when, when I think about where I am and what I do and what I'm able to do and the things I'm able to see. And I, I got to go back to the Liberty guys too, since we're doing basketball here. I mean, that experience, I can't say it enough. How, how awesome that experience was last year, how the team, the organization, let me, let me say this. The Nets organization and the Liberty organization, mm -hmm. they're both under the umbrella now of Joe Sy. But, um, you know, the Nets, since I've been involved with them, and, and now the Liberty after them, they, they have treated me like family, especially the Liberty. I mean, I'm, I'm more vested with the Liberty. I, I do the studio for the Nets. I'm not really at the arena a lot, so I'm not mm -hmm. with the players. But the Liberty players and the Liberty staff, the front office, the coaching staff, even the new coaching staff with Walt Hopkins, I mean, they, they just welcome you in immediately. You're part of their family. And, and I got to tell you, that means the world to me. For somebody to just accept me immediately, I'll run through a brick wall for anybody like that. 
well, you're you're in a great spot with the Liberty. Obviously, we know Sabrina, number one pick, and they, oh, they've God, got a bunch yeah. of draft picks. Like, it's a new era for the Liberty. Uh, on this podcast, we spoke highly of how Josai, the Liberty, the Brooklyn Nets, the Barclays Center, you know, just how they've moved in this climate right now where a lot of organizations, teams, businesses don't know how to move. Um, I'm very proud to be a fan of all of that um, and be doing a podcast around the nets and uh, you know, have people like you coming on the pod that are involved with the yes network and that call the games for the Liberty. You know, it just seems like there's a lot of good people involved. It just seems like a comfortable environment that's all inclusive. And that's what we're trying to push. That's what we're trying to, you know, get more people on board with uh, in a time where people are trying to divide us. We're trying to bring people together. So that's well, awesome that's, to hear. That, that, that's the thing, man. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I've been waiting to say this for a very long time, my entire life, you know, my, my parents, we, we grew up in a loving household and we were taught to love everybody. You know, it wasn't, there was no uh, nonsense going on in my life. And it's especially with my extended family too, man. I, I grew up in South River, New Jersey. It was a racially diverse place. Uh, and I was, I was uh, very fortunate to grow up uh, with, African Americans, Greeks, Portuguese people, Hungarians, Italians, Polish people. I mean, it was a it was an eclectic mix of people. And you know, that if you're in that bubble, you're able to break away from that and have a better understanding of what the hell is going on right now. And I could tell you some stories. Uh, I want you guys to lead this, but I just needed to say that. You know, we need we need more people bringing us together rather than separating us into different. Look, in my eyes, I was taught my entire life. We're all brothers and sisters in the eyes of God. And yeah. that's the way I live my life. And if that's wrong, then I don't want to be right. I, I mean, <laughs> that's just the way I am. It's the way I've always been. And that's the way I always will be. And that's the way I'm raising my children. I have two young daughters and uh, they're growing up in a household that teaches them to love and respect everyone, regardless of anything. It, it's that simple, boys. Well, Chris, you just showed that journalistic sixth sense that we know you have, and you just, you just got us a, a segue directly, directly <laughs> into our first segment. We're going what's now, and we're going to lead with someone who seems to be espousing the exact opposite of what you're saying, and we're staying in the WNBA, in your favorite league right now. We're talking about how... Uh, Senator Kelly Loeffler, maybe? I don't know. I'm not going to respect her because she's Atlanta. not respecting a lot of people. She's the co-owner of the Atlanta Dream. I believe she's a minority owner. She wrote the WNBA commissioner to express her opposition to the Black Lives Matter movement and asked the league to put the American flag on every jersey. She talked about how she doesn't want to politicize basketball, how she doesn't want it on the court, how she disagrees with a bunch of things that they're doing. So obviously we know how you feel about this talking about how much you value, you know, people coming together, right. And people, people working together. When you see something like this, how do you, how do you react as both, you know, Chris Sheeran, the WNBA play by play announcer or, and Chris Sheeran, the person. No, there's, there's no difference. There's no separation. Exactly. Um, and, and, and if I could um, do really quick, the shaking my head emoji. <laughs> <laughs> just let me throw that up there really quick because let's face it i mean you have both sides of this saying that black lives matter the organization stands for things that that aren't right and then there's some people that say i'm for the sentiment of black lives matter just not the organization they don't understand that what people are trying to say is that they feel and i've talked about this with people of color in my life okay I, I, I reach out to them when things like this happen. And that's not what, it, they're not trying to say that their lives matter than anybody else. They're just trying to raise their voices. They're trying to turn the volume up to say that while you think there isn't stuff like this that goes on, there in fact is stuff like this that goes on. And it's time to listen. It's time to have a conversation. It's time to talk. It's time to come together. This, what she's doing, and first and foremost, guys, she's worth $500 million. I looked it up before we came on. She's worth half a billion dollars. 
Plus she's got some uh, insider trading stuff that she's got to worry about too, but she's worth $500 million. She doesn't care what she says, okay? And we got to remember that politicians, follow the money guys, yeah. follow the money. Guys like us, guys who work paycheck to paycheck and pay our bills, you know, we're just like the sheep that keep walking. So people that want to raise their voice and raise their voice to unite everybody instead of divide, I'm all for that because that's what they're scared of. They don't want that. They don't want united people. They want the country. Machiavelli, you know who he is? Divide and conquer. I want everybody coming together. I don't want everybody separating. And what she's doing, by doing what she's doing, instead of taking the opportunity and I'll talk about the NFL in a second because they could have squashed this years ago. <laughs> but anyway, what she, this is just like exactly what Keith said. Her writing to Kathy Engelbert and, and, and writing what she wrote is just being divisive for her side. That's mm -hmm. all she's trying to do. She's trying to divide because let's face it, anybody against that sentiment has something wrong up here. They do. Something is not right. If someone says that to me, like if Keith came up to me and said that to me, I'd hug him. I'd hug him. Because how old are you guys? 32. 18. You're 18 and Keith, you're 32. I'm approaching 50 quick. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been on, I've been on this planet since 1973. And I'm going to tell you straight up, and this is what I've waited a long time to say publicly. I've told my uh, people of color friends this, whether it was on Instagram or text or seeing them in person, because I did go to see uh, a girl that I grew up with. I shouldn't say girl. She's a woman now. She's almost 52. She graduated with me. Um, but I went and, and I said, I didn't need, I never needed an organization or a hashtag to tell me that you matter. I always knew that because it was instilled in me from the day I was at, at, I could hear and it was audible and I could relay that. You know, when you're a kid, my, my kids, I'll give you the perfect example. My kids, they don't know black and white. They just, they, they say the names. Oh, well, so-and-so said this. So-and-so said that. They don't say a black kid said this or an Asian kid said this. That's the other thing too. Like for so long, and I'm, I'm old, I'm, I'm getting to 50. So just bear with me here. And, and this is the point. When I was another sports reference, but when I was six going on seven, it was February of 1980. So I was going to be seven in August. The U S Olympic team won the gold. Okay. They beat the Russians and then they won another game to win the gold. Everybody was waving an American flag. Everybody was proud to be an American. It was just that. It, it, when, when, when you watch the Olympics, you hated Russia like they were the Red Sox. <laughs> you hated <laughs> China like they were the Astros. I mean, you were just so full of your country's pride and, and you were rooting for everything. And now it seems like that's out the window. I don't want that to be the case. Everybody's been split and it's been a process, maybe 30 years. I'm African American. I'm Asian American. I'm Italian American. I'm Irish American. I'm Polish American. I'm, how about you're just American? Okay. And we all come together. And I brought up September 11th at the beginning of this in September on September 11th, 2001. I remember I left where I, I, I went to work at six in the morning. I didn't leave till nine that night. And they at route three was closed. The turnpike was closed. 17 was closed. I couldn't get home. So they put us up in the middle Lance Hilton. Nine o'clock, President Bush addressed the nation. There were all colors, all races in that bar watching him speak. All of us hugging, all of us getting together. We were united. All right. Everybody that ran into that tower to save those people, they didn't care what color they were. They just cared that they had to get people out of there. You know, and, and that's, that's what we need to get back to. We need to, we need to realize that we're all in this together, guys, all of us, regardless of race, religion, creed, sexuality, anything, we're all in this together. And, and all of those things that they try to separate us with, that's what, that's what's so divisive. 
that's what's so, uh, divisive. Sorry, I mispronounced that. I knew it. Yeah, I knew you were saying. <laughs> but, but that's the thing. I just, I yearn for a country, again, where my daughters and your kids, when, when they're born, they grow up and we're all Americans again. You know, we're all united. That's what I want. I, I, and, I just, it, it pisses me off so much that we're at this part. We're at this point right now pandemic racial unrest uh what else do, what else are we throwing in there um what else is going on i mean this My country list- is being exposed for all of its weaknesses and all the things that they didn't address and this juncture right it's it's no coincidence that it's 2020 i think what you're talking about is the vision of the future of this country that we all really want to see i mean now we're seeing more than ever some people don't want that they want us to go backwards they want us to make america great again it's a shame we're coming off fourth of july and uh i feel like people are confused we're hearing about like deshaun jackson and what he put out there he's certainly confused um americans are confused and african americans you know we're not so much confused we're confused that like we still have to do this that we still have to talk about this and i did see um, some account that I follow, they said, we're not celebrating July 4th. We're wearing all black. You know, this isn't our country. And I didn't agree with that. It I've, is. It I've is been to other countries. Country. We built this country. If, if we really want to talk about it, black people are just as responsible for all of this country's success. But we just didn't get the respect for it. We didn't get the credibility for it. We didn't get uh, the, the song and let dance the praise for it. Let me, let me ask you a question. You're, you're hundred percent right, by the way. And let me ask you this question. What do you think about black history month? I mean, for, for me, it's ironic that it's the shortest month of the year. And, uh, besides, I mean, besides that though, it, I, it's what, I think it's it, what Morgan I, Freeman said, there should yeah. be a black history month because of what you just said. Can I just think it's because like, it's you not help your people help build this country. I think it's um, it's not a, it's 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 not necessarily needed. Why don't we teach Black History instead of giving a month? It's it's kind of like just again like getting the short end of the stick. Like here we'll we'll I, throw you this month to I, highlight I it. And what I find every year for Black History Month, you know, working at John Boy Media, I sat down with John Boy and I said, "Yo, we got to do something for Black History Month." Mm-hmm. And he was open, obviously, to it. And we talked about it. And I said, "Listen, me being literally the only Black person that works at John Boy Media, I will spearhead it. I have the ideas." I have the video editing skills. I will create what we're going to do. And since we're baseball fans, I did things like highlight Major League Baseball. And I said, where are all our black heroes in baseball? The Hank Aarons, to the Barry Bonses, to the Ken Griffey Juniors, to the Tony Gwynns. Where'd they all go? Why don't we have them now? Why is there only 8% black people in Major League Baseball? Why is there only 8% African Americans in the league? And I talked about the black aces, right? The the pitchers that we have, the 20 game winners. I talked about... Um, a bunch of different things. The Negro Leagues. We're in the 100 years of the Negro Leagues. And every post that I put out was greeted with some type of negativity, some type of racism, people not understanding the reason that we were doing it. And that makes me think, like, you know what? And I said, I, I said, I said, John, like, we did this for Black History Month, but what we need to do is research and work on it and study it more. And we have an idea that's going to come out and it's not going to come out in Black History Month. We're just going to put it out when we feel like putting it out. Now, this is before the pandemic. This is in February, before everything shut down, before George Floyd was killed, before the protests, before everything that we're seeing. This is what we were on. And we saw the racism in the comments. We saw the ignorance in the comments. Mm-hmm. It's just what it is. And I feel like right now we're at a juncture in time where before we move forward, before we can get to this better place, we have to destroy before we elevate. We have to break all of this down. We, we've kind of been living in this, this like fake world that this racism that we see right now doesn't exist. And the only way to move forward and change it is to confront it. And we've been having now these uncomfortable conversations. We've been having these initiatives. And here's the last thing I say, because I want to get us in the basketball stuff. This Black Lives Matter movement and the hashtag and the group, I hate to see it politicized. I hate to see people, I guess, uh, Republicans, and I'm not, I don't, I've never voted, I'm not a um, political person, but mm-hmm. I know a lot of people that are following after our president are saying Black Lives Matter is the Democrats and it's a political movement. No, it's as simple as the phrase, Black Lives Matter in this country, in this world. You saw a protest in 50 states and 18 countries, which show you that it is not just a United States political movement. 
It's fact and people need to respect it and people need to start acting like it. And we need to figure out ways where black people can start feeling like it, where we can actually move throughout this country and feel like we are valuable, feel like we matter, feel like we are equal to everyone else. And it's simple as that. Don't complicate it and say that, oh, it's the Democrats or, uh, you know, people are trying to raise money for this. That's not what it's about. It's, it's, it's simple as the phrase, black lives matter in yeah. this country, in this world. It's divide and conquer. It's what I told you. It, 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 it's just, it, that's what they want. And that's what we have to fight against. It's as simple as that. And we will. We're, you know, a lot of us are fighting on our platforms. We're using this podcast as a platform to fight and spread the message. And uh, it's just the beginning. Like, I feel like we're going to be going through this for the whole decade. The, the 2020 vision is of a better future. That's the whole irony in all this. People are talking about new year, new me. 2020 is going to be my year. I thought it was. Pump I thought your, it was going to be my year. Yeah, pump your brakes. <laughs> pump your brakes. We got to fix this first. We got to fix this, sir. We got, like we were living the way uh, we were living is was wrong. Even like you know, I talk about the forty hour work week and commuting into New York City. I'm like, change that. Now people have seen you can work from home. You have all the tools. You have the internet access. We have Zoom. You know, you can literally set up in your home office and do the same stuff you were doing in the office in New York. The old way in New York City corporate was a you show up early, you leave late, you put in 40, 50 hours a week in office to show that, no, I can do the same thing in my house where I'm comfortable, where I have my coffee and my family and you know other things that I don't have in the office. It's actually saving me time on the commute. Like There are a lot of other things that we need to destroy and rebuild so that we can elevate into a better future. And we'll get there. Let's see. Now. Where are we you're, at? Where you're are we at on talking the- about, about working from home, people working from home. We're going to go into a hard segue back into basketball here. Yeah. The Heat, the Nuggets, and the Bucks, all those players from all those teams are going to be working from home. We got positive COVID tests, and all of their practice facilities are shut down. And this was just ahead. This was at the beginning of last of this week, ahead of people going to Orlando. So combine that with a lot of people getting sick, a lot of NBA players having some second thoughts. I'll go to Chris first. Chris, how do you feel about, you know, players in the NBA or the WNBA not being able to practice, not being able to get up to their level in advance of these, you know, supposed restarts? Well, first, I think the meals have to get better. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I just think, look, I think all these leagues are pretty much walking on eggshells. I give them an A plus for effort. Uh, for trying to get back, but seeing how, as you just said, three teams have shut down their practice facilities and then we're in that window where we're starting to ramp back up to a season, those eight games that will be played uh, before the playoffs start. And, you know, I got to tell you, I I just don't know. I I just did a New York Post podcast and Ken Davidoff, who writes for the Post, doesn't think we're going to get through the 60-game baseball season. So I can't, like John Sterling says, you can't predict baseball. You can't predict this virus. And I give all the players who are going down to Orlando all the credit in the world for trying to get the season back up and running. But it's going to be very interesting to see if they're able to even get to that first game of the eight-game slate. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a safety thing, right? So we, we listed on, in the notes the Heat, the Nuggets, the Bucks, close their practice facilities. But they close their practice facilities and they're traveling to Orlando. So I guess the, the facilities didn't need to be open much longer. Don't put anybody else at risk, people that work there, players. Um, and we do know that the players have reported to Orlando. And uh, Chris already mentioned the meals, which Hudson could take us into uh, the next part <laughs> that we're going to talk about. These, what we've seen so far from last night, these guys' dinners. Yeah, so we had Troy Daniels and Chris Chioza send out some, some, pretty, some pretty tough looking photos of the food they were being provided with. And, you know, I'm sure we've all seen them. The question that comes to, to my mind and the question that I'm gonna ask you guys is how, like, if they can't get the food right, right off the bat, and I know things have changed, I know it's supposedly going to change after the first 48 hours, so we have that to look forward to, but if they can't get the food right, how can we expect them to get all of these other safety measures right? 
I, I don't think you have to worry too much about that. I mean, I think it, I, it was funny that the pictures I saw with the food. I mean, it, it, the best comment I saw was it looked like a fire festival <laughs> meal uh, with the slices of cheese and the fruit and just like a, here's a salad. They just like took a handful of spinach and threw it in that thing and closed it. Um, I think the food will get better. I, I think that's not going to, that's not going to be something they're going to have to worry about too much longer. But my main concern is, you know, keeping the staff and the players in that secure bubble with no outsiders coming in and being able to infect one person. Because, look, let's say somebody has it. They don't know they have it. They're with their teammates. They go play a game. And I know they're – I don't know if they're going to be tested before every game. But they go out there, they play another team, and then both teams leave the bubble. They go back, and maybe they get tested the next day and the bulk of those teams have it, then, then what do they have to do? They have to quarantine half the team? Are they going to sign guys or are guys going to come up from their, their uh, G League team? I just don't know how that's going to work. I mean, I want it to. Don't get me wrong. I want this to work. I just don't know how it's going to work. Yeah, Joel Embiid came out and said that, you know, all I do is play video games. I'm going to stay in the room, but I don't trust the rest <laughs> of those guys to go out. Like, you know, some of these guys are going to head out when they have a little window – to head out and it's interesting that we saw the meals the first night it's it's laughable uh, on talking that's twitter we said you know uh this is giving us fire fest vibes because <laughs> not what you expect we know lebron is not eating this we know these guys are millionaires most of them have chefs and they also have like strict diets where this is going to get fixed in the first two days so it was a good laugh but poor there, poor chris Chioza things- doesn't have that chef yet yeah, well, yeah, you're, you're 100 percent right. Actually, like the guys on the Nets that went down there, they're not on the level of having their own personal chef. And that's, but, um, that's, that's I, uh, I think, I'll let you finish, Keith. I, I think uh, with, with the meals, it, it's it's good for a laugh, but there is some things in the horizon that aren't going to be laughable. This thing has to go on for three months. The bubble is in Florida. Florida is spiking, and if guys don't follow the like strict protocol, there's a, a high chance of someone contaminating their team or you know other players and this thing um potentially and even adam silver came out and said it you know if if the cases go up and we're testing players daily and more cases like they're gonna have to cancel this thing so um let's stay tuned i'm glad we could get a a laugh from you know seeing these meals that look like i don't know i saw like a watermelon cup a bag of chips they literally look like uh just like airplane food or like the stuff that you get in in the airport before you get on a plane where you're just trying to like you know nah, get you food eat, real quick you could eat better in the airport <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely could eat better in the airport <laughs> well that that brings us pretty nicely right into our next segment who's in who's out and we do have some people out a lot of a couple of nets a couple of nets are going to be out but let's start at the top dwight howard is in and he was one of the first people to come out and say after kyrie made his comments I agree with you, Kyrie. I don't know if going back is the best thing to do considering the political climate, but he did come out and along with Patty Mills and say they're going to be donating all of their checks to Black Lives Matter movements. So that's one person to think about who's coming in. I know Dwight Howard's definitely thinking a lot about that ring, just like LeBron is. I guess, you know, the question I want to ask is what do we think about them playing, but make still making that statement that they are going to support black lives matter, even though they're playing. I think that's the right way to go about it. I mean, if you truly believe in the cause and in the movement, uh, I think playing gives you that platform. And I know Kyrie's doing something on Instagram uh, and he's using that to uh, also promote it. So I think the players who are coming back, I think they could disagree with Kyrie and, and they could do what Patty Mills is doing. You know, I, that's, that's tremendous what he's doing. He's, he's going to go play. He's going to use his, uh, his NBA player status as a platform, and he's going to donate his salary to the movement. So I, I don't think – you're not wrong either way. If you want to stay away and, and, and it's because of that and you want to do things like Kyrie is doing, hey, do that. And if you want to stay away from the COVID thing, do that. And if you want to play and you want to get your message out that way, just get the message out. There's there's no right or wrong here in my estimation. 
Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I like that Dwight Howard is playing. I know he had some issues and we spoke about it on this podcast with his family. I like that he is playing. And um, on Talking Sports, I, I mentioned the fact that, you know, look at how the Lakers move under the leadership of LeBron James, right? Most of the Lakers are there reporting they're going to play. The Nets, um, I know it's, uh, you know, it's, it's completely different because our guys aren't healthy, but the Nets are under the leadership of KD, <clears throat> Kyrie, two guys that we've known for a while aren't going to play and haven't really spoke highly of the bubble. So I'm not surprised to see some of the Nets guys opt out, but guys like Victor Oladipo opting out, he didn't really play that much this year. Um, Pacers actually played better without him. Guys like Bradley Beal opting out. Not really surprised there. The, the Wizards don't really have that, that great of a team either. Um, that's why I'm pretty sure we're not going to drop out because I don't see the Wizards beating no, anyone down there. No, there's no way. And uh, as far as, like, who else is on this list? Oh, Nikola Jokic. Now, he missed his flight. That's a whole nother thing. But we were talking about him a couple weeks ago and how you have to – you have to test negative twice before you're right. cleared. He finally did that, but then misses his flight. He should just opt out. He, I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens with the Nuggets. They probably don't want that. Yeah, definitely not. And, you know, you're talking about a lack of leadership. And I don't know if this is, you know, correlation, not causation. I don't know. But we did have two Nets players officially dropped out, an additional two, bringing our total to four that have opted out because of COVID. Spencer Dinwiddie is out. Torian Prince is out. Like I mentioned in the open, seven people in total from the Nets roster before going into COVID are now going to be out, are not going to be in Orlando, are not going to be playing. Chris, what do you think about all these Nets players dropping out? Um, listen, the players who've tested positive, I don't blame them one bit uh, because we've seen throughout this pandemic uh, that it does come back and they can get it again. We still don't know what the long-term effects of this are if you do get it and it's bad. Uh, I have nothing wrong with anybody who wants to stay away and just, you know, saddle up for 2020, 2021. Uh, but as far as the Nets competing down there, it's, I think, I, you know, in, in your notes, which were beautifully done, by the way, uh, I saw that um, the Nets don't have a, a player over 6'9". The only one that they have is Jared Allen. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's going to be challenging when your front court right now, I know Amir Johnson, uh, was being bandied about as the Nets seeking his help, but your front court is basically (laughs) J.A. So (laughs) it's going to be interesting to see. I know, but Keith's point, uh, is, is very salient here. And that's the the, the point that, uh, Bradley Beal has opted out. And if the Wizards had any shot, any shot at all at catching the, the Magic or the Nets, Beal had to be down there in Orlando. And, and him not being there, I just don't see how the Nets, even though they're very shorthanded right now, uh, are going to drop out of the playoff race. Yeah, definitely. It definitely uh, goes in a lot of faith in the face of people who are saying that the Nets should tank, the Nets should just get that draft pick. But you segued perfectly. Your second to last segment, which it seems to be a theme here. You're the king of segues. We're going into what's nets. And the first thing we're going to mention is we record this on July 8th, Wednesday. Yesterday, Tuesday, uh, the team went down to Orlando. So that's how we got to see Chris Chioza's opening meal. We got to see yep. the group of people that are going to Orlando, regardless of like their, you know, their injury or whatever. So we do have Karis LeVert. We do have Jared Allen. We do have Tyler Johnson. I don't know. What, so we're not dropping out. We're, we're all on the same page that we're not going to be able to drop out of the playoffs. But as a team, do you think that there's a line that we might hit where the Nets might just drop out as a whole team? That's a fair question. I don't know if they do that. Um, if they're going down there and the players are there already and they left, I would, I would put my money on them competing. I would think this would be a decision – that uh, Sean Marks uh, and, and ownership makes before they even get down there. So if they're there, I think they're going to play and they have a plan in place. Uh, and like Keith said, I'll, I'll say it again, I, I just don't see any way that they fall out of playoff contention. Do they lose the seventh seed? Perhaps. But I don't think they fall out of the eighth seed. We're going to play. I mean, we're going to play this yeah. thing out and we're going to play with 
these backup guys with these guys we're signing, we still have guys to sign that we can sign. Um, and what I look at it as, and I've said this a bunch of times before, this is like a tryout. This is like summer league. This is like a, like even like an NBA combine workout. Like we're looking at these players to see who actually belongs on this team with Katie and Kyrie. That's going to be a championship is, level. This team. is, this is when they'd be playing summer league anyway. And then that's a, that's right. a great point. I mean, this, this is, this is a chance for Chioza to say, Hey, you know, maybe I deserve to come back in 2020, 2021. And as, as Nets fans, I want to say this to the Nets fans. I, I said this on talking sports. As Nets fans, like we, we had no chance of winning this bubble. We had no chance of winning the finals this year. We were a playoff team, yes, and we still are going to be a playoff team. And if the coronavirus didn't happen, whatever, maybe we would have met the Raptors and stole that series. But it was always a dream. Just like Katie and Kyrie joining us, rejoining us. We talked about it all year. That was a dream. And them coming to Orlando, it was a dream. As Nets fans, we need to – Keep being patient as we've been for literally a calendar year now since we knew Katie and Kyrie were coming this way. Oh, it, it's been longer than that, my friend. <laughs> oh, yeah. <well. laughs> Talk to the guy oh, who's been doing the pre- and post-game shows. <laughs> uh, from the New Jersey Nets days of watching those us take some, those multiple some L's. Long. The patience, those were, the patience those continues. Were, yeah, but, those were some long, long, long West Coast trips. Of course. Back in the day. I mean, we, I mean, we, we know it. Uh, luckily, like, the, that's in the past. But, hey, if we've waited this long, keep waiting. Next year is going to be ridiculous. And it's, it's going to be everything to look forward to. But to look forward to now is to see what these young guys got, see what these young guys do, and look at the entire NBA. There, you, I don't think you can be a Nets fan without being an entire NBA fan because it's not like we've had that much to root for over the last few decades. Look at – the storylines in the NBA, will LeBron and AD do it? Are they the favorites? No, now it's, they're saying the Clippers are the favorites, Kawhi and PG. Giannis still wants his shot at stealing a title. Guys like Jason Tatum have come out from the Celtics to say, why not go win it? The defending champs, the Toronto Raptors, still think that they have the team to do it. And this is an element where the best team, the best well-coached team, the best practice team will succeed. So watch Watch with more than the, the Nets eye. This isn't, a, this isn't really about us. And the Nets organization is not trying to make this appealing for Nets fans to watch. This is part of building for next year. Let me ask both well, of you guys. Let me, let me ask both of you guys a question. If, if you look back, if they get through everything, they get through the playoffs, they, have, they, they crown a champion. Um, is that, does that champion come with an asterisk? Or do you look at this as a real NBA champion? I will say it will have an asterisk, but um, nobody talks about the year that we – was it 2000 and – I forget what year it was when the Spurs won it and there was a lockout. Nobody talks about that. They all 99. talk about – It was 99 because they beat the Knicks. Okay, so <laughs> that year, right, there was a lockout, and nobody <laughs> talks about that in the Spurs dynasty, and this is a good way to segue to the next thing we're going to talk about. But nobody talks about that championship as not being a real championship. They lump it in with the Spurs dynasty and all the championships that no, they have. No, you're right. So you're I right. think if, like, if the Clippers win, and I've said this on the pod, if the Clippers win, this is going to be like a passing of the torch in L.A. But if the Lakers win, then it's like the, you know, the Lake show is back. If the Bucks win, it's like, okay, well, that was the Bucks' opportunity because they weren't going to win it any other way but this time. So I think it's just going to – you know, and it'll be the Bucks' first championship in, in decades. So – um, I think that this will hold the same way the Spurs championship holds in their dynasty or whatever. And the next thing that we want to talk about is this godfather offer that was rumored to be out there for Greg Popovich in the last week. They're saying um, Joe Sy is supposed to be offering him an offer that he can't refuse. And uh, <laughs> this is all I'll say on it because I don't even really want to talk about it. It's not happening. <laughs> There's so many factors for this not to happen than to happen. Nets fans, I know we are the biggest dreamers in the league. It's not going down. Even if the offer does go out, he's not going to accept the offer. He's not coming here to coach the Brooklyn Nets. And he's, it wouldn't work with Katie and Kyrie. And he's got, we just talked about his dynasty and what he's built in San Antonio. Greg Popovich is not the next Brooklyn Nets coach. I'm sorry. sorry. But Keith, he sold his house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so what? He might want another crib. Like, he might want a smaller place. Like, 
people sell their houses and move in the same like city location? He's old, man. You think he's trying to come all the way to New York in the middle of a pandemic American he's 71 revolution? 71 years of age. Yeah, you think he's trying to uproot himself and finish his career out in Brooklyn? No. With Katie and Kyrie, I saw a lot of talk about that. People saying how thin-skinned Katie and Kyrie are and how, you know, they're superstars and how they're used to, like, basically running the team and how they would never work with Pop. Now, I'm sure they have respect for Pop. I'm sure they would, in theory, be able to work with Pop. But I don't think – Sean Marks is trying to make that happen. And I understand Shark, Sean Marks coming out of the – no, Popovich is not, is not going to coach the Brooklyn Nets in the future. Well, I think we're going to stay on that theme of it being a tryout, just like it is a tryout for Jacques Vaughn to see if we can make sure that we're okay with him being that coach instead of Greg Popovich is what a lot of Nets fans are going to be thinking the alternative or was. Or Tyron Lue. Or Tyron – well, yeah, but that one, that one I'm okay with. That one – I, I got no complaints <laughs> if we're not getting Tyron Lue. But – we got another player here who has done two things. He has first decided that he is going to choose his jersey name. Zan and Musa is going to wear equality and peace on the back of his jersey to honor George Floyd. Obviously, we've had a lot of talk on this podcast about achieving equality and peace. And for someone like Zan and Musa, who is definitely not the, the apple of a lot of Nets fans' eyes, is not maybe the, the best player on the team but he's one of our three players that is six nine or taller and he's going to get run because he has to what do you see this and i'll go to chris first do you see this as a good move on his part absolutely why wouldn't he i mean i think that's i think that's what every uh person with a brain wants is equality and peace um i just when you say john and musa though i i have to you know have a little levity here the one image that I have burned into my brain is Kyrie taking him and throwing him into position <laughs> in one of the games this past season. But yeah, man, who, who who's going to get upset over the back of a jersey that says equality and peace? I mean, yeah. Nets Twitter. Duh. Duh. Nets Twitter. <laughs> well, then, look, if you're looking to Twitter for uh, people to have some sort of grasp on real life, then you need to delete the app for at least a week and walk around without it. Because if you're not swimming in the cesspool for a week, you kind of cleanse yourself of all that stuff. And you don't go in and you don't look at the trends and you don't look at the, you know, you don't go down the rabbit holes of all the people that are going back and forth. And, you know, social media, it's great, but at the same time, it, it just brings stuff out of the woodwork that you just want to go, oh, gee, God, no, no. So I, I, I take social media breaks from time to time. I do. Um, and, and, it, and it helps because a lot of the stuff I see on there, look, I told you about my dad and my cousin, and that has put me into this mental state. To, you know, this, this was before the pandemic started. So I was already... We lost four people last year in my family, and we never really got a chance to mourn anyone. And that's not, that's not easy, you know? So, and then when your father passes away, that just rearranges your entire wiring of your brain because when you expect to be able to text him or call him and he's not there, it just messes you up. So I'm trying to process all this stuff that's going on right now with all of the grief I'm trying to process as well. So it, it's been a hell of a run here the past, since March when Spencer Dinwiddie hit that buzzer beater to beat the Lakers out in LA. And I did the show with Frank Isola and we were supposed to do the next show in Milwaukee without fans, which I was totally looking forward to because you were, you know, with the hot mics everywhere, you're going to be able to hear the players the entire game. We didn't need mic'd up Monday. <laughs> they were going to be mic'd up yeah. without being mic'd up. And we were really looking forward to that, both Isola and myself. So it's been a hell of a stretch here for me mentally. And I'm trying to grasp all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's just not easy, guys. But the one thing I can grasp is if a player is wearing equality and peace on the back of his jersey, it's not going to piss me off. It's going to say, yeah, duh. We, that's what we want. We want to move forward. We don't want to go backward. Yeah, we put too much weight into social media. My background is in social media. I understand it. I get it. And with NBA Twitter and Nets Twitter, them getting that Musa over this is it's just like 
it's in the wrong space. What I get where it comes from because some of the players said that the NBA um, they kind of limited them by saying what they could put on their jerseys. And with Musa selecting one of the things that you know was out there for him to pick, people were like, "Oh, but that's foolish." What I'll say about Twitter, NBA Twitter, Nets Twitter, social media. Before we move on, most of these people online are under the age of 18. And also, these are public opinions from anonymous accounts. These are public opinions from private accounts that we give way more weight than they actually deserve. We have no idea who these people are speaking. Like, I think we even, you know, with all of this stuff that has gone on in the last couple months with George Floyd and um, the protest and Black Lives Matter, and even the people on the other side, you know, whether it's Trump, MAGA, whatever, the, the internet, social media is good and bad. It gives people a voice that deserve it, but it also gives people a voice that don't deserve it. Well, I think the last thing that I'll say about John and Musa wearing equality and peace is, you know, he is not an American. He is from Bosnia and he knows about what the consequences of a lack of equality and peace are. He's almost only a couple years older than me. He grew up in terrible, terrible, terrible conditions in a country that has just torn itself apart and literally exploded into a bunch of different countries over issues about equality and peace. So I think it's great for him. And I think to any clowns on social media, just in general, not just about this, uh, if you're going to say something on social media, first off, don't. But second off, at least be a person and think about what the person that you're saying these things are is and the fact that that person is a person. But hard segue into our last topic on the Nets. We have four slots for replacement players. Amir Johnson's name was being floated around. There's a lot of other names that people are talking about. We need to fill slots, ideally with someone who's taller than 6'9". <laughs> so Nate uh, Robinson, Nate Robinson is off the table. <laughs> he, Chris, I want you to both give me one name of one player to fill the slot. Oh, wow. Anybody? Man, let – let Swaggy P get some run. I saw Swaggy P was talking about joining the Lakers. Why not? Let him get some run out there. Uh, I, I see people throwing out Jamal Crawford, and he can't play. Um, I forget who else was out there. But at this point, come one, come all. Any, anybody could be in these next four spots, like four replacement spots. What about Shump? You can bring Shump back, no? Nah, Shump, I think, is uh, on vacation. Shump jumped out. Yeah, he's out. He's on, <laughs> his wife is pregnant, and he's been oh, posting right. like, He's he's off it. He would be great for us. Obviously, he played with us, but he was he was very affable. Yeah, uh, Amon Shumper. All right. Well, I think that's going to end our Nets talk, but we do have a little bit more NBA talk. A couple more things to hit on. The NBA has released its scrimmage schedule, and in just about two weeks, we're going to be, I believe, recording a podcast on the day that this happens. The Nets are scrimmaging against Zion and the Pelicans. Boys, what do we think <laughs> about a Nets team with no one 6'9 or taller and uh, Jared Allen, who uh, is not exactly built like uh, a freight train, going up against <laughs> Zion and the Pelicans? Uh, Jared's going to get into foul trouble quick. Um, <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, that's not a problem when you have Clax and you have uh, DeAndre uh, on the bench, but you don't have either one of those two moving forward. So it's going to be interesting to see who the Nets bring aboard and, and how they're going to handle this. But, um, you know, you got to think about everything. And, and you got to think about the players and, and mentally what they're going through and what they're thinking every time they walk into the bubble and every time they're scrimmaging in a game. You know, they're trying to compete at the highest level while in the back of their minds, they're thinking, all right, am I going to get tested positive with this tomorrow? So there, there's a lot of factors going into this. Uh, and I think Zion is just another one of those <laughs> big things, literally and figuratively, that the Nets are going to have to worry about in that first scrimmage. But it's just so much to have to take in and try to process uh, but they're down there and their job is to play some basketball and beat Zion and the Pelicans in that scrimmage. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting. I wish we had access to watch the Nets take on 
the Pelicans, not just for Zion, for Lonzo, for Brandon Ingram, Josh Hart, um, some of the other guys that got on that team. Uh, the same way we just watched this intra squad scrimmage on Yes Network. I wish there was um, some type of Yes Network coverage on that Wednesday night. We do the next Nets Classics on Wednesdays on Yes. But maybe NBA Network or uh, NBA TV, rather, will check in on that. Um, I'm not too concerned about it. We'll see. This is all practice. We're going to have to play small ball. Jacques Vaughn's going to have to set something up. And, yeah, we record on Wednesdays. We've been booking uh, the Yes Network broadcast crew. And if everything goes as planned, we will have special guests from the Yes Network on the 15th and the 22nd to, you know, complete what we're trying to do here. I'm, I'm looking forward to Wednesday, July 2nd for sure. Hard not to, hard not to, but we have good news. We have a voicemail. We have, been, <laughs> we have been asking people to call in the voicemail line ever since we started it. See, things kind of tapered off when the league ended. We had some people call us and then hang up without leaving a voicemail, which like, yeah. what are you doing? There's not like, it's not like you can accidentally do it. You got to copy and paste it from our, bi- our Twitter bio into you know, your phone. So there's a lot of work to just not leave Cold a message. Feet. Cold yeah. feet. They're just, they're just afraid, and that's okay. That's Some okay. people get nervous. I know. I mean, it's not like you're calling into WFAN. It's not like you're calling into the Michael K show. And you're leaving I, a voicemail. It's not live. I see these pop up in my phone. We had three missed calls with no voicemails, but this voicemail comes in from our guy, our, our guy John, Mr. Burn Notice. And uh, you guys might remember John from the Yes Network stream that we did, the first Brooklyn Nets watch-along. He was in studio with me. We watched the uh, Nets beat the Pacers. It was an epic game, a uh, great game to pick. So let's see if I can play this for you guys. And um, he's going to ask a question, and then we'll react to it. Howdy, 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 guys. It's John, a.k.a. It's your burn notice. Hope you guys are doing well. I guess my question for the Nets in Orlando, if Carol Avert goes off like we know he can, does that make him – more or less likely to be traded next season. I love to hear you guys thought. Take care guys. Have a good one. That's a good question. That's okay. a good question. So John wants to know if Karis goes down there to Orlando and he balls out, which when we're looking at this team, I think a lot of people gotta gotta realize like Karis is gonna have the ball in his hands the whole game. Uh and even Joe Harris is gonna get more open shots, more looks to Boy, shots, but we're talking about Karras here. If Karras goes down there and balls out, is that going to make him more valuable to trade or more valuable to keep? I think uh, unequivocally that makes him more valuable to keep. I I mean, why wouldn't you want that third head of the monster to go along with KD and Kyrie? Why would you trade him away if he goes down there? And what are you getting back for Karras Levert? I mean, if you, I need to know what you're getting back first. But to me, this kid was drafted by the organization. He has grown every single year, even past injury, yeah. a catastrophic injury. This guy came back and was more than, than he was before he got hurt. He has worked so hard to get to this point. He, he exemplifies to me what that whole culture and what the system was made for when he was drafted and how he went out there and defended Kenny Atkinson, man, his stock just rose with me when he did that. He and Kenny were close. You know, Kenny was very instrumental to the development of Karis LeVert. So I, my personal opinion, I think they keep him, and I would want to keep him if I'm a Nets fan. Keith, you are a Nets fan. So what would you like to see happen? Man, I, we, we're keeping him. I said from, from, The time he was dropping 50 on the Celtics. And even before that, he had a thumb injury this year. And when he came back and, you know, late in the game, uh, he he wasn't in a game that we lost and everybody saw him on the bench. And Kenny kind of was like slowly bringing him back in. I'm like, man, let him rock. He's a star. He's got star power. He's got star power potential. I think if he goes down there to Orlando and leads this team as like the superstar on the team, we don't trade him. We don't, we don't let him go. He is one of our guys. And, I know I, I thought we drafted him, but, you know, he, we actually acquired him on draft night from right, Indiana. Right. Um, I think I said on one of these podcasts that we drafted him. We forget that that happened because he is homegrown. He, he does really feel like one of our own, and he is. Um, like you said about the culture in Brooklyn with Kenny and us watching him from 
when he broke his leg, missed time. Like, we still haven't seen a full season of Karis LeVert. No. We do not want to let him go somewhere else. And you else know what? And that's then see scary. him do that somewhere else. Keith, that's scary. The, the yeah. fact that you still haven't seen a full season out of this guy. And here's the other thing that Isola and I or Spinarkle and I, who, Sarah and I, whoever's in studio with me, whenever we talk about Karis LeVert, he's got that killer instinct, mm-hmm. man. If, if Kyrie and KD were not on this team, this would be Karis LeVert's team. Make no mistake. Spencer Dinwiddie would not be taking the last shot. It would be Karis LeVert if they were both on the floor at the same time. Karis has that, and I hate to be stupid here, but the eye of the tiger. You know, <laughs> My nickname is Creed. So <laughs> I grew up loving Apollo Creed. I have the shorts. <laughs> I have, not only do I have the boxing shorts, I have swimming trunks now. I just Apollo. had an Apollo Creed shirt on for 4th of July see, from Roosevelt. See, yeah. see, there you go. <laughs> but I, want, I wanted that shirt. I had it. I was going to order it, and I didn't, and I should have. But I got the, the results, the, um, the American flag ones that he wore in the first fight. But, uh, yeah, man, he just he, – like I said before, I just want to reiterate it. He exemplifies everything that Sean Marks and Kenny Atkins are now no longer with the team, but – he exemplifies everything that they wanted to do in, in the rebuild of this team. And think where this team is, guys. 2016, 2015-2016, Lionel Hollins goes bye-bye, okay? Kenny comes in 2016-2017. So we're talking one, two, th- like four seasons. This is almost a complete turnaround. And, and that's how they got KD and Kyrie over here. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the culture, everything else, the, the Brooklyn way. I, everybody was laughing at them, but look at the Nets now. Look at the Nets now. And they are on the precipice of doing something extremely special next year. So back to your point, Keith, about being patient just a little bit more. I mean, the fans who are with this team for the long run, they remember 2009, 2010, that 12 and 70 record. You know, I, I filled in for Jessica Taff a lot in that, in that locker room. And there's only so many times you could ask Brooke Lopez, how disappointing I, 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 you saw it, but I'll tell you this. I want to bring him up because Belo, you could say what you want about that guy. He's the leading scorer in, in, in Nets franchise history. Love him or hate him. As soon as that game was over, he was in front of his locker, win or loss, ready to talk to the media. And he was always there front and center. And he, he took it on the chin. That's I have the Yankee nothing- way. That's, how they, that's, that's the Yankee he was, way. <laughs> and, and people might, people might give me uh, some crap for this, but he was, he was Jeter, man. He, he just owned up to everything, and he answered for everybody. There were nights where everybody ghosted, but Brooke was there in his locker. He never went to the shower first. He sat in front of his locker, still had his uniform on, had his head in his hands. He would pick his head up, and he would do the interview, and he'd answer every question. I have nothing but respect for that guy. Yes, absolutely. He's the captain, and I use those words uh, very, very, very specifically. The last thing I'll say about Karis LeVert, you guys hit it on a basketball point. I'm just going to talk about culture-wise. As Nets fans, we all want to have some of that, that likability, some of that feeling from that team that we had in the playoffs last year where it was you know, all homegrown, all these players that we poached from the second round of the 2014 draft we kind of want to have that vibe and Karis brings that vibe, but he brings that vibe as a star. I think when you look at all of like the past dynasties that we've had, every dynasty has had at least one of those homegrown players. You look, you know, if you look at the warriors, they had two, they had Steph, they had clay. If you look at, if you look at the heat, they had D Wade, all of these teams have these homegrown players, and I think we need to have that. And I think Karis is that homegrown star that we can make great use of. But now we're going to move in to our final segment, What's On. In this segment, Chris, basically what we do is we just tell the fans what to watch, what's on TV, what movies to watch, what's going on. It doesn't have to be <laughs> basketball-related. can be about anything. So, Keith, I'll let you lead off. What's on? Yeah, hopefully I can uh, get this podcast edited and out tonight, Wednesday. But I'm pretty sure this program you'll be able to find um, even after today. I don't think it's like a one-time live thing. So Kyrie Irving, our Kyrie Kyrie Irving, Brooklyn Nets, he's got a TV program coming out tonight, um, basically 
just shining more light, which is unfortunate that we even have to put this much attention on it. Um, shining more light on the death of Breonna Taylor. She's a young EMT who uh, was shot in the middle of the night by police that entered her home with a no knock warrant. And these officers haven't been prosecuted yet. This happened in March. Here we are in July. But this is going to come on tonight. And uh, what's the name of the channel? It's, it's called Say Her Name, Brianna Taylor, 7 p.m. tonight. It's on the Players TV Digital and Broadcast Network. I think if you search it on YouTube, it'll come up. I'm sure the link will be out there on Twitter tonight. And uh, it shouldn't be hard to find if you want to tune in. Players TV launched in March on Samsung TV. I think it's like on Samsung T TV, I have it. I think it's channel 1116. But uh, I'm interested to see what they do. I think Common, the rapper, is involved and some other prominent people. But this is a situation where, you know, it's just unfortunate. It just plays into everything else. Uh, uh, the system is messed up, wrong. This person was an EMT sleeping in their house. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, Black people deserve to be able to sleep in the comfort of their own homes without someone barging in and potentially shooting in, into their house or whatever and actually taking a life. So. Um, if you're looking for something to watch tonight, and even if you're not looking for something to watch, I think it's something to, to support, and it's, it's good to get as many eyes and ears and attention on this as possible. Entered the wrong home with a no-knock warrant. She did. Right. What did, I, was, did I speak wrong? Yeah. I, yeah no, you, you, just, you just said that they, she entered her home with a no-knock warrant. It, she, they, entered they entered the her wrong home, home. Right. So. with a no-knock warrant, but it wasn't the home that they had the warrant for. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go next, and I'm going to make it a little more basketball-related. You know, we always have Keith go first, and Keith always drops these massive, like, truth bombs <laughs> on us. He did last week. He did it again. And now I'm over here. Like, last week I said Hamilton. Now, like, it's always, like, something, like, way less Bro, serious. Before and, like, you go, I tried to watch Hamilton. I mean, I know people love it, but, like, my fiancé and I sat down to watch it. We made it not even to 20 minutes, and we are like, my thing is, like, I can't get the full story through, like, raps, through lyrics. Like, I, I was waiting for them to stop and actually, like, have the play and have lines and dialogue. I'm like, wait, the whole thing is, like, song, 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 song. <laughs> for two hours and 20 minutes, I, I didn't finish it. But, I mean, I did take your recommendation to watch it on Disney+, Plus, but I didn't last longer than, like, 18 minutes. Here's the thing. Uh, you know, you talked about me maybe going to be in a radio and TV major. I still have a little bit of that history major in me, so that Hamilton's a little bit like porn to me. But you gotta, <laughs> you gotta know, you gotta know what the background is. I think is important. But at the end of the day, I took your recommendation too. I, I, I gave you know my country some thought. I thought about everything that was going on. You know what I stand for, what the flag stands for, and all these things. And as much as I always come with the slightly less serious recommendations, like I'm going to right now. It's important to do what Keith says. It's important to watch these things. It's important to take time to think about these things because if you don't, then you're a part of the problem. Uh, on that very somber note, uh, watch. It was on ESPN a little while ago. Uh, LeBron's, it was Backstory, The Decision. It was on ESPN a couple Sundays ago. It's still on. If you have ESPN Plus, you can definitely watch it. I think it should be on demand. But it gives some backstory onto The Decision. There's some Nets talk in there, how Jay-Z influenced The Decision a little bit how the decision got so much hate from the commissioner's office. So it's very interesting as a basketball fan, definitely interesting as just a LeBron fan, or even just as someone who's interested in like the personal aspect of everything that went on with that. All right, Chris, do you have anything? I can't follow either one of those. Uh, and pretty much guys, I have to keep two young girls entertained uh, with activities in a pandemic. So I'm not really in tune with the TV right now, but uh, Keith, I will definitely try to find uh, what you brought up with Kyrie in common. Uh, I misspoke earlier. I thought, I thought it was coming through IG. I guess I thought wrong, it, but I, I mean, it I might be on multiple platforms, Yeah, but I know YouTube specifically and then Samsung TV. Okay. They, they should stream it everywhere. You could possibly stream it. Well, and then if it's on YouTube, it, it's real easy. Yeah. You can watch it on your phone and you just made yeah. me think of something common. Common was used by the Yes Network in the I'm going with Brooklyn. Like, Common yep. was our guy in the commercials this year. Like, you know, coming up, the Nets are playing the Wizards. Yep. You got Common on the court at the Barclays Center saying, I'm going with Brooklyn. So there's two, you know, there's two Brooklyn Nets tie-ins to watching this program tonight. Uh, but if, I, if you guys haven't watched Ozark yet, get on that. 
Oh, of course. <laughs> I've seen every <laughs> episode have to, of have to. It's great. Have to. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's great. Yeah, it All is right. ridiculous, but you have to watch it. <laughs> All right, boys. Let's close this one out. Had a great time today with Chris Sheeran. A lot of good talk, a lot of serious talk. So, Chris, if you can tell everyone where to follow you at. I know you had some negative words about Twitter, but you do have a Twitter. <laughs> you have a little bit of a following. You put out good content. I believe you put – your pin tweet is one of your daughter hitting a dinger, so you have to love that. Where can we follow you at? Uh, actually, you could follow me on Twitter at Chris Sheeran. Yes. Uh, it's my name. And then the yes network is just Y E S though. Uh, Instagram, I'm keeping the close friends and family. So I'm not giving that out. Keith, you're part of that family. So you are invited. Uh, but I'm trying to keep that just to people I know and people that I've actually seen in my life. And, uh, just to, um, uh, piggyback on what you led to me with Hudson. I should have led with this first, but uh, you said uh, important conversation. And, and, and that's what we need to do uh, every day, have conversations and come together and not further divide. I mean, that, that's what this is about. It, it's talking amongst one another and it's all coming to one common goal. And, and, and if we have to fight for it, we have to fight for it. But at least ears are opening now and people are starting to talk. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to follow that. You, uh, you have been an absolutely phenomenal guest today. Uh, for all those who are listening, give him a follow. Don't forget to follow <laughs> at, uh, not on Instagram, no, not on Instagram. Don't forget to follow at Talking Nets on Twitter and Instagram. We're always putting out content, always doing our thing there. You can find me at Hudson Flint underscore on Instagram and Twitter. And Keith, where can they follow you at? You can find me at Keith underscore McPherson on Twitter. You can find me at Keith McPherson, one word on Instagram, my first and last name. Don't follow me if you don't want the hard truth. Don't follow me if you don't want someone that is completely authentic, real, and comfortable in their own skin. I've lost some followers during these last three months, but I've replaced them with new people. So if you want to follow me, Come along for the ride. I'm a Yankee fan. I'm a Nets fan. I'm in the football too, but my football team I don't really know about right now. Um, keep McPherson on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere else. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hudson, Hudson oh. one more thing. One more thing. Good luck in school. <clears throat> uh, do your work. <laughs> Got like a month hard. till you go back. Yes, yeah, I know. Hard. I'll be back there. And Keith, keep doing what you do. Just like I, will. I told you, I will. Just, just like I told you on Instagram, just keep doing what you do. I appreciate that. Chris was one of the, Chris reached out to me before some of my friends and family saying, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Speak. People need to hear you. And that was a big boost for me. I actually reached out to, uh, you know, some of the other people that I've connected with at the Yes Network. And like I said, you know, I, I feel like the people that I've met at the, the Yes Network are like mentors to me. Josh Isaac. Kevin Sullivan, Jonathan Ziegler, like they've done so much for me so quickly. They're all solid people, good guys. I know that they echo the type of stuff that I've been putting out. And, uh, and so are you. And, and that's what people have to understand. And that's how we move forward. Yeah. And, and that's what people have to come to realize. You know, you're just trying to open people's minds and ears and eyes. And uh, we're with you. It's great. It's great. You know, absolutely. Um, what else we got? Make sure you guys leave a voicemail. You guys heard John's voicemail. You can literally get on the pod by leaving a voicemail. Don't call and test out whether the voicemail works. It works. You'll hear a little message. Leave uh, your voicemail, your name, and we'll put you on the pod. Um, Absolutely. Follow us. Follow Chris. Not on Instagram. He doesn't want you there. Follow <laughs> Keith. He wants you there as long as you're not a clown. Keith, close us out. Give us a let's go next. Um, and a subscribe, rate, and review the pod. Oh, yeah, this was true. a great pod. I can't wait to edit this and clip it up. Um, we need some reviews. It helps us just look better out there. Subscribe to the pod. Rate the pod. Write us a review. We'll see you next Thursday. Let's go Nets. Brooklyn.